Good morning, everybody. This is Keith Salmon, and this is the Million Dollar Story series. I really appreciate you being here, and I am honored and privileged to have a very special guest. Uh, her name is Vivian Eisenstadt, and she's right here in, in Southern California with me in Los Angeles area. I'm in Santa Monica, and uh, Vivian is over in West LA. Is that correct? Yes, the end of West LA. All right. Well, welcome to the show. I really appreciate you you coming on. Um, my um, mission for this show it's called the Million Dollar Story series for the mm -hmm. uh, for the purpose of saying that everybody listening, everybody watching, uh, you and me, we all have million dollar stories, and I mean a million dollar story that's inside the heart right here. It's not necessarily a million dollar monetary uh, story, but it could be. Um, I believe that this is a uh, synchronicity game in a, in a way. It's a matter of a great story, a great person, a great audience. And if they're all lined up, the stars are lined up and you're re ready to receive that million dollar story of inspiration, uh, it may in fact change your life. So that's what this show is all about. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to have Vivian here because I, I think she's got a great story and uh, people will definitely uh, resonate with it. So um, I know that you're like, you're. I say that you're a physical therapist, but you're so much more than that. And yeah. um, so you've got a, you've created a world for your clients and yourself and it's mind and body and healing and so on and so forth. Could, why don't you just tell us a little bit about, uh, Vivi Therapy is your company and, um, but your world is so much more than that. So let's tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, I'm originally from Brooklyn and in the seventies when things were very interesting and, uh, I was a tomboy and I just, uh, you know, I hit, uh, I was captain of my basketball team. I was like my father's little boy, but I was a girl and I went to uh, Brooklyn college and I got to Brooklyn college and you know, the point guards like six foot three. So, what's a little Jew to do. Uh, so I became a phys ed major and our professor, Bill Chisholm, may he rest in peace, took us, our class to a uh, or outpatient orthopedic physical therapy place. And I'm really grateful and really lucky that I had that light bulb aha moment. It was in college, you know, some people don't have it for a long time. So, um, I went right back to school and went into the counselor's office and said, tell me what prerequisites I need to take. And I, you know, I was also a personal trainer. I worked for this guy, Stu Middleman and Equinox, the fitness club actually hired us uh, to do the first fitness testing programs back in the late eighties. So we actually started the fitness testing program. So I was always into something having to do with the body. And so I went to, I got a master's in physical therapy. I got a bachelor's in health science, a bachelor's in athletic training. And I worked in Manhattan for a while. And then I moved out to LA. And my first job in LA was at Cedar sinai at their outpatient. And uh, then I moved and helped develop their spine center way back when in 2000. I'm dating myself. You might know how old I am by the end of this story. And then I opened my own, uh, then I worked for this woman, this really crazy German woman in, uh, in uh, Brentwood and then Beverly Hills. And she did Pilates when Pilates first started out. So it was Pilates based physical therapy. And so I learned and she ran the clinic like crap. And so I learned through working with her how to make the clinic, you know, streamlined and appropriate for physical therapy and legal. And I was going to be a, a partner with her. And I walk in that day and she goes, I don't want to work with you. It was like a jealousy whack job thing. And there I was. And I knew how to run a clinic. I was about to be a partner in a clinic. And so I borrowed 30 grand from my dad, which I paid back. And uh -huh. I opened my own place in a gym and I called it prevent the pain therapy. And I worked there for about a year and a half. And, and then I realized, you know, it was just too big for this little room. It grew. 
So then I thought I didn't want to pay anybody else rent. So I bought a duplex and I created Vivi therapy, prevent the pain therapy. Now, the reason why it's called Vivi therapy instead of prevent the pain therapy is because uh, I'm very uh, aware of how our words have power. And so it's really oxymoronic to be saying the word pain when you're talking about not having it. And so I looked it up and there was no antonym to the word pain. So uh, two years I thought about it. And so I made up a word, Vivi. And then I deviate everything. And now you're in Vivi therapy where living Vivi is living pain free. Um, also on a side note, I, uh, I came down with Epstein-Barr virus in college. And I had that and struggled with that through physical therapy school and through working in New York and through moving out here. And when I went on a chemical uh, program to get it in remission, I had this out of body experience where my body fell to the floor and I was just raging on the floor. And I remember thinking as a scientist side of me, like, huh, I didn't know I was that angry, but the anger was stored in the cells of this virus. And from that moment on, I couldn't really look at physical therapy as just physical because at every moment we are living our lives with physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual all, all the time. And if you move one, you're moving all three. So as thorough healing, if you address all four, then you can make permanent healing results. And uh, I put myself in a spiritual psychology course after I had a couple of mishaps and I was down at my bottom and I said, you know what? I need to work on myself. That's I'm the only person who's going to make my life better. And this spiritual psychology course was a master's program for two years and it's experiential. So I worked through a lot of the stuff that I was going through while learning how to coach other people to do the same. And it has made all the difference in the world in my healing center. On top of that, there are a lot of modalities in my healing center. And by modalities, things that get your body into a healing space, so that way your shoulder will actually heal, your low back will actually heal. Um, and then, you know, as icing on the cake, I have some gifts I can intuitively find out where to go when somebody's in pain uh, or what to say that triggers their release. Um, and I'm, I feel really grateful for that because that's something that I can't bottle. Like I've tried hiring other therapists to expand my practice per se, and it's just not the same. So I have uh, concluded that I'll just keep working until I, I don't work anymore. I'm sure I can take a lot of the concepts that I do with posture and stuff and eventually make a program or put them in the book. Uh, but, uh, you know, Vivi therapy is a very unique place and I love what I do. Got to love what you do. If you don't love what you do, don't bother. Right. Right. No, that's clear. Now for, for people who may not know about Epstein Barr, uh, what, what, what exactly is that? Epstein Barr is a virus, which is one of the reasons I do not want coronavirus. I've had a relationship with the virus for over 10 years, and I'm not interested in getting it again. Uh, a va it's like getting mono. I don't know whether anybody knows what mono is. Basically, I went from bench pressing my weight to not being able to get out of bed and thinking, hmm, maybe I didn't sleep. So I go to class, and then they go, today we're going to learn. Tomorrow we're going to learn. And I'd be like, okay, maybe I didn't sleep well. And I go to the next class and today we're going to learn tomorrow. We're going to learn. I'm like, Whoa, finally I fell asleep. I woke up. The class was gone. The teacher was gone. Everybody was gone. I said, something's really not right. So I went to the doctor and he diagnosed me with that. And then once you get past the first six months, once I got past the first six months, because everybody's experience is different. People have chronic pain. It's like a cousin of fibromyalgia. Everything hurts. Everything hurts all the time. And you're only given a certain number of, of energy. So I'd either study, go to the bar, go to the gym. But then once my energy was done, I, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move. It was, uh, 
I had to learn how to live with this constant pain and constant fatigue. And when I say I couldn't move, that's when the fatigue got unbearable. But even when I was moving, I was in a constant state of fatigue. And interestingly enough, even though it's in remission, my body, my brain has a hard time knowing when to rest because I've taught myself how to be tired and still move on. So mm -hmm. I have to consciously balance when, you know, when I, I'll like work until, until I can't move, but then I'll rest and I'm working on that. Right. Well, thanks for, thanks for uh, explaining that. Cause it's uh, the assumption that people might know is, is always, you know, sometimes I'll say, Oh yeah. And then I go, well, I really need to ask that question so that I fully understand it. It's, it makes so much sense of how you're, um, you bring that in to your practice, that experience. Oh yeah, I mean, when a patient comes in and they've been in pain for like three years, right? I'm like, yeah, I remember that day. And there's something about uh, being a witness and being present to other people's experience and really just acknowledging what they're going through because their pain is real for them and not to discount. So like growing up, my dad, he was military and he'd always be like, and you know, my mother would be crying all the time. So he was sort of over it. And he would be like, if I would cry, he'd be like, oh, Vivi, just meant, you know, suck it up. And I wanted to always please him. So I try to suck it up, you know? But then when I was an adult, I, I turned to him and I said, you know what, dad? I really wish I was born that way where I could just turn it off like you turn it off. I really wish, it's a really awesome trait to have, but this is who I am and this is how I need to process. And if I don't process, the way that I need to, it's damaging to my health. So either deal with it or just go in another room. <laughs> right, right. Well, I think that letting it letting it out. I mean, I I, I relate to that also. We we were um, we were not a big hugging family where we we weren't really smiling for the camera either mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So uh, endure and suck it up is something. Mm -hmm. that completely relate to and it was very I, generational back then it, you know right now crying i think is courageous not crying is not pussy you know i don't care and, and everybody i have certain machines that help release trauma and so you know people cry all the time in my clinic and i'm like mm. and all i say is so, okay the tissues are right there for a reason and you know if you create a safe space where you work then you're allowing other people to have a more thorough experience when they're there. Mm -hmm. There was someone I was talking to a little while ago and, and they, um, it was the first time I'd heard it put quite this way is that you hold, uh, she was talking about holding that space, you know, and just really just having that. It's like, I, I I'll be honest with you. I, I screwed up on a schedule. I double booked myself a couple of weeks ago and, and I totally missed an appointment, a zoom call. <laughs> and, I, the only way I thought I could kind of make amends to the, to the guy was to uh, invite him onto another call. And I said, even if you don't show up, I'm going to hold that space for you. And it, it sort of like was a very symbolic kind of thing. Um, but when you're in the room with someone and you hold that space for them to just be themselves, be who they are, be experience what they're experiencing. Um, I think that's, you really do a great job of doing that. And like, if you say, if you can, if you can get someone to release some of that pent up emotion or whatever it is, just let it go kind of uh, feeling, they may not have that anywhere else in their, in their world. Well, so. that's where people store their stress in their muscles and bones and joints. So you're going to have that somatic response a lot. If, my job is to release those areas. Um, Carolyn Miss, if anybody wants to look her up, she's she deals with chakras, how every area is a different chakra. First chakra, low back. First and second chakra, low back. One-on-one um, uh, -on -one relationships, money issues, it's all down by the low back. Uh, the, the mid back or the upper low back, if you have knee pain, sometimes that goes to the upper low back or comes from the upper low back, that's um, having courage, having the ability to move forward, third chakra, um, mid back pain, upper back pain, heart chakra, uh, but mostly in this day and age, it's throat chakra because of the neck and the computers. So the, it's like a chicken or an egg. 
The throat chakra is about speaking your truth. The throat chakra is about feeling heard. The throat chakra is about um, having the world weight of the world on your shoulders. Uh, and one can affect the other. So if you're sitting all day in front of the computer and you and your neck and shoulders and everything is getting so tight, you're going to start having a hard time expressing yourself. You're going to have a hard time. Uh, you're going to start feeling like the weight of the world is on your shoulders and feel all stressed, stressed out. And it's right. because you choked your throat chakra. So that, that's a lot of what I do for a living is get people into their posture and get people out of their heads uh, and get people to release what they're holding and storing and give them some tools to do it on their own. So they don't have to come back, which really sucks because my turnover rate is really high and I have to keep getting new clients. But Thanks to COVID, everybody's in front of their computer, and I'm sure that I'll have work until I pass on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that cracked me up. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so if, uh, you know, a lot of times we have uh, we have people that we look up to, and whether they're uh, people or superheroes or anything like that, is there any superheroes that you would like Ooh. to? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman, it's my pillbox, <laughs> Wonder Woman. Yes. So what does Wonder Woman mean to you, except that you look a lot like Wonder Woman and you are a Wonder Woman oh. of your own? Oh, yeah, you know, it's funny, you do it long enough, you, uh, you know, I actually, I actually uh, might have morphed into I mean, I always like jump in front of people when they're having fights and like, like I've had two guys like yelling at each other about to punch each other and I come running out of the house like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, I don't know what I'm thinking, but I'm, I have that, I've always been that person. I always try to help. I always try to make a difference. Uh, Wonder Woman was the woman that you looked up to in the seventies with the TV show and I was a tomboy and people used to call me super jock and I felt very manly when they would call me super jock and I took it totally maybe the wrong way but it was devastating that I was teased and bullied like that uh and Wonder Woman was gorgeous and just as strong and just as fast and her father my father was uh in the in the uh, army and she was in love with Steve Trevor who was in the army and they were fighting the Nazis and I grew up Orthodox Jewish where everybody's fighting the Nazis and so there was so much dichotomy on that. I just had this book of compilations of comics and I read it over and over and over and over. And then I broke the binding and then I cased, I, I taped the binding and I read it over and over. And then when eBay showed up, I started collecting Wonder Woman memorabilia. And so I have about uh, 1500 pieces of memorabilia for Wonder Woman. It became a little thing. Well, that's awesome. I, I mean, I think that the, um, what I know about you from just uh, these couple of stories, is that if there's something that's going to help you along your journey, you get into it. When you get into it, you really get into it. It's like, why well, do you, something half assed? Right. You know, that's whole ass. That's what whole, I say. Whole ass. Whole ass. That's <laughs> and awesome. Whole ass. No. <laughs> um, so would, uh, you know, in the, um, in that sort of epiphany that you had, like, uh, you know, when you went back into the counselor's office and said, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? It was there, was there, was there like a, a, you know, for me in my epiphanies, any epiphanies I've ever had, I, it, it wasn't just like one thing. I never had like the burning bush moment. It's more like a perfect storm where all these things kind of line up. Was it something like that with you? No, it was like somebody hit me across the head with a baseball bat. Okay. It was like, because it satisfied the doctor lawyer part for my parents without having to go to med school because I didn't like blood. So, and then of course I get to physical therapy school and the first thing we're doing is gross anatomy. And I'm like, like the whole reason I didn't go to med school was because I didn't want to do gross anatomy. And then I get to school and the first class it says anatomy lecture, anatomy lab. I'm like, what? And then the, I'm like, what is this? And I stopped crying. I got tears down my skin. I'm just, but I did it. And it was so fascinating. Like, that's how you learn. When I was doing volunteer work for the for the orthopedic place, uh, you had to do volunteer work before you got into school. He said, if you really want to be a good physical therapist, you've got to know 
everything about the human body. Right. And so I ended up delving into that gross anatomy class because that is what's going to make me a good physical therapist. It was growth. But after a while, my brain just shifted and, you know, I dissected a whole knee one day. It, it, you just, you know, it worked. Yeah. I, I suppose, uh, you know, walking through that grossness part and maybe it's fear. I don't know. Uh, it, it's just sort of like a you tough gotta do what move. You got to do. You got to do, do what you got to do. do. Yeah. You take a deep breath and you do what you got to do. And there are many times in life where you just got to take a deep breath and do what you got to do. Right. And it may feel like shit. It may feel uncomfortable. It may feel miserable. Like me doing patient notes, not a fan, <laughs> but I got to do what I got to do. So, right. you know, I do it in, in my own way. And, um, it, 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 it's, it's a means to an end sometimes, but courage is, you know, to be afraid and still do it or, that's literally the definition of courage just to be afraid and still do it. Right. Um, I could only guess, I and mean, you could fill me in and tell me if I'm, I'm right or not. So I think a lot of times when people self-diagnose themselves, they come, they maybe do they come in with, and they tell you what's wrong, but then you actually tell them what's wrong because they've self-diagnosed. Them. Yes. And I'm sure that happens all the time. I think that happens in, in general, even in the non-physical therapy world, they didn't go to school, so they don't right. know what I know. Right. I say, you know, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a money manager. I go, great. When I need my money manager, I'll come into your place and shut up because I don't know how to manage money. I, it's not what I do. I failed math in fifth grade. I, I took summer school for it. I hate money issues. So, you know, the, a good president finds people around them that do what they do well. You get yourself a nice, good cabinet. So do what you do well, but don't assume to know everything if there's somebody else who's been doing it for 30 years. Right. I don't get mad at them, mind you. It's just, um, it's a control issue for many people. Right. People want to be in control. Right. Well, and I think, one I, of the, oh, go ahead. You go. And one of, the, one of the biggest breakdowns when people come into my office and one of the things that's holding their neck so tight and holding their back so tight is because they want to have control over what's going on in their lives. Right. And the truth is, and especially after car accidents, people have tremendous post-traumatic stress because it was this one second in their life where they realized they do not have control over anything. You can try your hardest. I know you were driving fine, but some schmuck behind you can just hit you going 60. And you don't, and, and the challenge is getting over the somatic, Somatic means in your body experience of not being in control. And so when people are doing all the Google searches and trying to figure out what's going on for them, it's their way of trying to get control over the fact that they have no control over their pain at the moment. That's, right. that's the challenge. Right. Well, I think it, it, it turns into a little bit of a willingness. I, I, I guess what I'm, I'm reaching for here is that there's, probably a moment when a person will come in with their own diagnosis and they may fight you on it, even if it's in internally, but then when they find out that you, you have the balance issue, you know, it's like, if the, if this hurts, maybe it's because it's something over here type. Of yeah. Thing. I don't discount what they say. Right. I don't, it's not a me versus you thing. It's I'll hear what you have to say and then I'll do my thing. And if we're on the same page, great. And if we're not, Great. <laughs> right. Right. But I, I, I just, I, I envision a moment where they go, all right, I put my trust in Vivian. Well, that's, that's the whole point of the evaluation ex exactly. is to give the person trust and give the person hope. Right. That's trust. the whole goal of the first evaluation is for somebody to feel like this might be a place where they can get to the next place. Right. If, if you don't feel I can help you, you don't come back and that's okay too. Right. Cause not everything's for everybody. Right, exactly. No, that's what I was getting at. Is it that that moment of 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 uh, willingness, openness, and 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 developing a relationship, and and then you can do what you do best because they're ready to receive it. They're not going to resist it once they trust you. Right, as with anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I always say that the 
the intention of my clinic is people come here when they're ready to get better and not a day before. Right. I have, uh, you know, Jerry, um, white, the massage guy. Oh yeah. 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 Yes. So him and I, he's been working on my body for a while now and I've known him for months. He's come up to my cabin in big bear. And last night was the first time he allowed me to work on him. And there's no rush, you know, but something in him must have wanted to get better. Like it, it can happen at any time. I've had people who've had my, my uh, brochure for two years and they're like, yeah, I had your brochure, but I finally decided to come in. I've had people that tell me that they tell their friend to come to me all the time and they don't. I have wives that say that their husband finally decided to come to me after talking to them after they see how well the wife does. And then they're like, you know, but they still don't want to come in, but they'd rather just complain to the wife about what's bothering them. Everybody's got their own rhythm. My goal is to elevate as quickly as possible all the time. Uh, that's my, that's what lights me up. What lights me up is working on myself. What lights me up is, is improving myself, healing, getting, getting, just being the best I can be at all times. I enjoy, I, you know, I'm hard on myself, but I also allow myself to relax. But what was I getting at? Oh, I have this new machine. It, uh, I, you've been to my clinic, right? That I have this live stream machine that literally puts a high frequency of electricity through your body. And that has helped people release emotional trauma. Uh, the developer has developed a, a handheld one and I'm just using it on my brain for like 10 minutes a day. And I used it yesterday for the first time and I had more energy throughout the entire day. And then I just did it this morning for another 10 minutes. I'm gonna do it 10 minutes a day. I guinea pig myself on anything that I have at my clinic. Anything at my clinic that I have is because I believe in it, because I've used it, and because I've seen results. And again, not everybody may see those results. However, 80% see results with the different things that we have here. We have physical therapy, we have massage therapy, we have infrared sauna, which helps detoxify after you have cancer or just to lose weight, increases the body temperature. So your body, it's about the body healing itself. Your body is always healing itself and aging is where your body can't heal itself as much as it's going the other way, as it's destroying itself. So I have all these different modalities and ASEA, this drink that you drink every day, which has these redox molecules that help your body repair and anti-age. Uh, and now, now I'm working on brain repair with this, with this machine. I'll let you know how it goes because uh, he's looking to mass produce them. And I may be on board with that because if it works, do it. Right. Now you're a super entrepreneur in my mind. So yeah. it, it's, it's to me, I have ideas. It's a question of uh, following through on them. I got well, ideas. Well, you have ideas that you follow through on. That's the, that's the, that's what makes the difference of of uh, someone who's walking around with an idea in their head and in their guts and in their heart, and they never do anything with it. You know, it's a burning desire, but they have it in their head. So, um, I think that your business is is like the inspiration for any entrepreneur. It's like taking a dream and making a dream come true, taking a dream and taking some action and making something happen. And, and with the uh, side effect of helping other people, you can make a living. Well, I think, thank you. And I also believe that there's a bigger picture. The universe is always working with us. Okay. If I wasn't kicked out of that physical therapy office in, in Beverly Hills, I wouldn't have been in this place where I needed to make that decision. What happens is, the way that the universe works is you, I, I put out what I'm looking to achieve. I think about it. I repeat it. I repeat it. And it may not show up in a way that, that looks like it looked, you know, like in my perfect world, I'd, you know, flow into this clinic. It never shows up like it should, at least not for me. But it's a matter of when those moments happen, like 
rejection is God's protection. When you have those moments where you're thrown into a scenario that's uncomfortable, that's where you're growing. That's where you have to figure out why did this happen? And in spiritual psychology, we learn that everything is always a blessing, no matter what, even if it doesn't feel that way, even if it doesn't look that way. Me getting Epstein-Barr was a blessing because my body became so sensitive and so hypersensitive that I became a great guinea pig for all the modalities that I learn and do. If I didn't have a crappy body and a hypersensitive nervous system, I wouldn't be able to understand half of the modalities that I do and what they do. But I can be like, oh, this is doing that. Oh, that is doing that. Oh, I feel sick today. That must be working because holistic medicine takes out a layer of, of the illness. So that's my blessing. Getting deathly ill for 10 years made me a better therapist, made me a more compassionate therapist, made me a more understanding therapist, made me a better person to work on my own stuff. I mean, I've had a lot of crappy things happen in my life and each time it happened, I was like, okay, well, how can I take this and learn from it and where's the blessing? And sometimes I don't see the blessing for like a while. I'll be like, you know, whatever that blessing is, it's hiding, you know, but, and uh, it's there. So uh, also there's something called the human design, which is like a double astrology chart. And in it, there are like little triangles, like triangles by your head and a square by your stomach. And some of them are colored in and some of them aren't. And my human design, I did mine, it has my stomach colored in, which means that my decision-making process comes from my stomach, like my gut. Like when I decided to get up and move to California in 10 days, it was because uh, I got that feeling. I called up my dad. I'm like, hey, dad, uh, uh, you want me to be happy, right? He's like, yeah, what? I said, I want to move to California. He's like, what? <laughs> But that just happened because I was on the phone with somebody in February and he was like, well, it's warm here and the top's down and it's 80 degrees and something just went whoop, whoop in my stomach. So how do I make my decisions? I sat on my motorcycle. It was the most expensive motorcycle in the store, but I felt the feeling. Then I looked at the price tag. Then I looked up. I was like, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> so if you can learn how to communicate with how your body and mind and soul and spirit speaks to that greater angels, guides, whoever's, whoever's guiding you through your life's purpose. If you can figure out how you communicate with that, then you can practice it and grow it like a muscle. So like my triangles up here are empty. I'm so empty. No, which means like, say you wanted to go to the movies You'd say, Hey, let's go to the movies. And I'd be like, yeah, sure. You know? So my brain just, is okay with, with, with other people's input. You, hey, Viv, let's do a podcast Friday. Sure, <laughs> you know? But, uh, but because I'm aware of where those big decisions come from, if that was filled in, I would probably be more of an analytical person needing to weigh the pros and the cons and see what works for me. And there are tons of people like that out there. So do your human design to figure out where your decision-making skills come from and then practice it or be aware of it or acknowledge it. Wow. I'm not sure where mine is. I, it might be a combination. It might be, I might have maybe. a couple of, yeah. You may be. Yeah. Yeah. You made me think of my trip to California. It was, it was, it was there. It was the desire. I had the desire to uproot and go, but I wasn't sure exactly when it was going to happen. And then hmm. my friend called me up and, I never knew he wanted to get into the Navy SEALs, but that's, he says, I'm going to San Diego. And I was on the plane with him. Well, that's what I was, that's exactly what I was talking about earlier. You think about something, mm -hmm. you think about something and when the timing's right, it'll show up. Right. Right. And I think what, I think one of the things that I've learned later in life is to be um, more aware because of the synchronicity moments that happen in our lives, sometimes I didn't ever see them. Something happens twice, you have to listen to it. Right, right. If you hear the same thing twice in one day, just do whatever it says. <laughs> just don't even, don't even ask. Just be like, oh, okay. You need right. me to see that movie? I'll see that movie. <laughs> right. No, that's exactly right. So, um, so 
so you're on the west side here. Now, do you do anything? Because uh, I, I believe that you could be, uh, and maybe this happens, it's that you could be uh, talking to people all over the world, talking about the things that we were just talking about today. Do you have people that do, do, do ring you up for the mind part of this? And, you know, like you say, the, you know, somebody has a, a posture issue. I mean, a lot issue. of people, a lot of people in my, in my cl class became life coaches and everybody's zooming. Uh, I've just been busy. You know, yeah. I bought a, I bought a house in Big Bear and renovated it. It's ready next week. Herzl's hideaway. My father was Herzl. He passed away two years ago. And with some of the life insurance money, I, I wanted to create a way that I can support myself. So I bought the house, I renovated it, and it's going to be a vacation rental as well as, because I have four dogs, uh, a place for me to, a respite for me to go to with my four dogs because that's a lot of money for a hotel for four dogs right, right. <laughs> and traveling. But it's two hours away from LA, so it's really comfortable. I was going to so ask. Doing that. What? I was I was going to ask about the the dogs. It's a lot of uh, a lot of feet, and I see someone sleeping right back there. It looks. <laughs> it's Marlon Brandog. This is my bodyguard. He stays uh, with me. He awesome. just follows me around, makes sure I'm okay. He's he's a good boy. He's two years old. Look how serious he is. Very serious. <laughs> That's awesome. He watches out for me. It's funny. My four dogs are so different. So he's my uh, bodyguard. And then I have Maximilian Kisses, who's my therapy dog and sits on people. And then I have Hope, who sits under the table and lets people pet her. And then Stella, who just gets herself into trouble and then lays on her back to tell me that she's too cute to be punished. <laughs> That's funny. Wow. Now, <laughs> If, if uh, like I was saying before, I, I consider you a super entrepreneur, and a lot of people that may come across this uh, podcast live show uh, that will be on the replay, obviously, um, what uh, if there was something that you could tell them? Because I see that you acted on some intuition, you acted on some signs that you were given, and you, you acted on things, and you made dreams happen, and and I uh, feel a responsibility because I'm engaged in a conversation with you to ask you to give them a shot in the arm, give them a little bit of, you know, tell them how to act on their dream or tell them to act on their dream. You know, I'm asking for a little tiny bit of advice that you might give somebody who might be sitting on the fence of their, the rest of their life and not doing anything about it. Oh, okay. You're an action person. You could be dead tomorrow. And if you die tomorrow, you'll die not doing what you wanted to do. Is that worth it to you? Then sit on your couch. You know, this isn't, this isn't a, a trial life. This is the, the life. You, this isn't a do over. This is it. You know, the world living is just, you know, you do stuff and then you pass on. So what do you want to do? This, this is the time to do it because you are breathing because you are alive. And if, if you don't, if, I mean, I've always been an action person. Just, I, you know, if someone says, to, my ex-boyfriend would be like, you know what's your problem? Every time I say to do something, you just immediately do it. And I'm like, hmm, okay. Like, yeah, because he was faced with the fact that he didn't do anything that he was thinking of doing. And I guess I showed it to him, but it's, that, it's just who I've always been. But you got nothing to lose. What's the worst that happened? So there were like a couple of little things that I've, I've gone through life with that I think really helped push me. Mm -hmm. One of it was like in the 80s. It says Nike, just do it. Just do it. Two is you visualize the worst scenario that could happen if you do something. And you will see it is not as bad as you thought it was going to be. Right. So if you think of like the worst, everybody will hate me. I'll have no money. Well, how many friends you got now and how much money you got now? Like, so what? Like, what's the worst that'll happen? The worst thing that ever happens, you die. But anything other than die is not that bad. That's great. 
No, that's that's what I'm looking for. I I think that anybody can take that and 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 see that there's you know, there's a chance for everybody. Everybody's got an opportunity to do whatever they want to do. And everybody's going to do it on their own time. Right. And to be loving with yourself when you're not ready to do it. Right. And not well, I, beat yourself up if you're not ready to do it. Because that beating of yourself up, it just prolongs you not doing it. Because then you're just reinforcing the chemical of sadness and anger and depression. And it's just not serving you. That's another thing. If it serves you, do it. If it doesn't serve you, don't. If me being mad at myself and not getting off the couch is not helping me, I'm not going to be mad at myself. I'll be kind to myself. I'll be loving to myself. And the more loving you are to yourself, then the more you feel you deserve better things. Right. The more you're happy, the more you deserve to be happy. The more you feel into wanting to feel that way more often. Right. Well, that, that inspires me. I mean, that just tells me that, you know, there, uh, I have a chance. Um, You're I mean, doing it. Look, we're I, sitting here right now. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, sometimes I, I, that's, that's what my mission here is to get people to say, look, look at that. How do, how do they even do that? How do they go on their Facebook live? How do they do that? How do, you know, that's a big leap. That's, that's I'm a not big, a big Facebook live person either. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I always play defense in basketball, you know, like I always, I, I never was like in front of the camera. I'm not very comfortable in front of the camera. I mean, I don't know. I guess I you have to care. I, I used to not be comfortable in front of the camera. Now I just don't care. Right. <laughs> hey, right. everybody, turn 40 and then start having your dreams, you know? Because <laughs> right. you'll stop right. caring so much. Right. Well, I think that there's lots of, you know, pivots, a lot of ad adaptation, a lot of, you know, survival in, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, people's journeys, they have, they have parts of the journey that are smooth and parts of the journey that need some, uh, need some inspiration to get you through. And that's what I True. think, you know, that transformation, all the things that you shared about the things that you worked through is it, it wasn't just that you had, um, you know, things in your life that might've slowed the normal person down, but they, you took them and you, and you, and you made them work for you. And instead of just having them keep, you know, the transformation out of those things to, to do something with your, um, with your passion and your dreams is, is the inspiration that that's in, important in this show. Let's just say for that, for that very reason, for somebody sitting there going, God, I don't think I got it. I don't think I can do it. And it's like, well, this is to say, you are here to say, yes, you can. And, you know, what are your choices? And I, I appreciate you saying that. There were times when I was so sick but I had to work or go to school. I would think of when the people were in the Holocaust and that they would get killed if they stopped walking in the snow. And I had to use that kind of a visual to say, if they could do that, I can get my ass out of bed and take that test. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's where I had to, at one point draw my, courage from was insane scenarios because if they could do that, I could do this. Right. All right. Yeah, exactly. I know so, that's a little morbid, but it, no, you know, well, it's all about mentality. It's like a marathon. You hit 18 miles and then running is all about what's in your head. There's nothing that has to do with what your body's doing. Right. right. Like everything's a mind trip. So find what scenario will keep you going and get you going. It doesn't have to be a negative scenario. It can be something inspirational. Like I want, you know, you put the pictures of the pretty girl on your fridge because you want to lose weight, you know? So it's a mind, everything's a mind game. So it's about getting your mind in the right place and then taking it day by day. Wow. Well, Vivian, thank you so much. We're going to, um, we're going to get any kind of links or any sort of um, information about you. I'll put in the links to uh the replays and we'll sure. send, send those around to people and uh, p places where people can contact you. And um, I can speak uh, firsthand. I, I went over and I didn't realize that I was going to get any treatment, but I did go in person to uh, Vivi therapy and it was extraordinary. She threw me on a table and she threw me onto that live stream <laughs> machine. And, and all of a sudden it was like, 
I walked out. I think I was a, uh, an inch or two taller. Mm -hmm. I had a, a spring in my step, and and it was uh, it was pretty pretty fascinating. And and the passion that Vivian speaks about is real. And the idea that um, you know it's more than just like uh, running in and getting your neck cracked somewhere. This is right. about this is about a mind and body, and about it. it's an experience because life is an experience. So I mean, I, I appreciate you taking the time to be to be here today. I, I feel, and I've said it before, but I feel it's a mission. My mission is to uh, bring people that I respect in this world of entrepreneurship, one thing, helping people is the other thing. Um, and to, uh, you know, give people that, that sign that we're all looking for a sign. And this is a sign that I believe can uh, be there for other people if they're willing and ready to accept that sign and, and act on it. And That's it's, awesome. it, it's not an intervention because interventions don't work generally, but uh, it's for people that are ready for it. And, and right. I think that that's, that's what this format is for. And uh, Vivian, Vivian Eisenstadt, uh, Vivi Therapy in West Los Angeles and worldwide, in my opinion. Uh, thanks once again for joining us. And um, Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Keith Salmon, and uh, I would like to encourage you to join my Facebook group. It's called the Million Dollar Story Ninjas, where uh, you know Vivian demonstrated her million dollar story this morning and uh, today, uh, depending on where and when you're watching this. And um, that's uh, what we do in that group, and we try to nurture your story and understand how you connect and uh, with other people. And it's really about connection and, and trust and relationship building. And of course, it's it's about business too. So um, all that to say, um, Vivian, thanks again. And we will catch you guys on the next episode of the Million Dollar Story series. My name is Keith Salmon. And thanks so much for joining us. Have a great day.